Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September meeting of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority Commission. I am Andrew Taharzadeh, Assistant Director of Communications at the EDA. I am your moderator for this meeting, which means I will have control over the audio functions of this Zoom call, and I will control the PowerPoint slides that will be used for the meeting. At this time, I would like to ask all those on this call to please mute themselves. I would like to welcome these members of the commission who are attending this meeting. Chairman Kathy Lang, Vice Chairman James Quigley, Secretary Ron Johnson, Treasurer and Assistant Secretary Christian Deshar, and mem members Lenny Hainsworth and Stephen Partridge. FCEDA President and CEO Victor Hoskins and Executive Vice President Alex Imes are on the call as are EDA Consul Mike Groff, a number of EDA staff members, consultants who represent the EDA in offices overseas and California, and are marketing communications consultants. I would also like to welcome Fairfax County officials who have joined us for this meeting. County Executive Brian Hill is our guest speaker tonight, and we will introduce him shortly. This is a public meeting of the commission and is being recorded. Presenting tonight will be Chairman Lang, President Hoskins, and Executive Vice President Imes, Vice President Donna Hurwitt, and two guest speakers for the evening. Fairfax County Executive Brian Hill and Kevin Hudak from Brightline Strategies, a real estate research firm. Members of the FCEDA Commission who have questions will have the opportunity to ask questions as they normally would during meetings. If anyone from the public has any questions, please select the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask a question or email Cheryl Martelli of the FCEDA. Cheryl's email address can be located in the chat box. We will not answer questions from the public during the meeting, but we will respond to all questions in writing afterward. So with that, I will ask Chairman Lang to begin the agenda. Chairman Lang. Thank you very much, Andrew, and good evening to everyone. I want to welcome you to our September meeting. Uh, we have a very interesting session ahead of us featuring our county executive and an update on an office market survey and analysis that the FCEDA has undertaken. So we'll start with several administrative tasks. The first one is I would like a motion for the approval of the August uh, minutes. May I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. Do I have a second? A second. Thank Ms. you, Lenny. Is there any discussion? I'm going to ask our attorney, Mike Graff, to take a roll call, please. We know it's hard to follow the votes in this in this setup. So go for it, Mike. Uh, Ms. Mr. Deschauer. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Here. Ms. Hainsworth. Yes. Vice Chair Quigley. Aye. Chairman Lang. Yes. Thank Minutes you. Approved. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I would like for Commissioner Deschauer to present the Treasurer's Report, please. Thank you. Uh, so, emailed out to, in advance to everyone. We'll take them mostly as read. I think the only thing to note this month, um, and Donna can expound on it more, but running slightly ahead in the first two months of spending in the talent initiative category. I think we spent a quarter of the budget um, there to date, but that's largely due to uh, website um, construction. So uh, that should make sense to everyone. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Donna who has some additional comments. Thank you, Chairman Deschauer, Madam Chair, and good evening to everyone. I have two items for you this evening. Um, the first is an information item only, and it is the draft report for our fiscal year 2020 financial audit. This audit is undertaken every year, and um, currently Cherry Beckert is the accounting firm that is doing the audit for us and for the county. This is a draft report. It was sent out to the commissioners in advance of the meeting. 
And so far, this draft indicates a clean audit for fiscal year 20, but the auditors are still working and still working with the county. I will bring the final report to you in October, and at that time, I'll ask for a vote from the commission to accept the report. If any commissioners have comments on the report, um, please provide them to me this month before the report is finalized. Just as some background information, this report goes to the county and is rolled up in their CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report of the county. And so therefore there are requirements that are dictated to be included in our report, including some detailed information about bonds and their outstanding balances. And I would like to thank our legal counsel, Mr. Graff, for providing this information to the auditors and to the county. If you looked at the financial statements, you may have noticed a $2.4 million increase in expenditures in fiscal year 20. This is due to the county's microloan fund for which the EDA is a conduit. This does not affect our budget in any way. And in fact, similarly, the RISE grant program that is occurring right now um, will impact next year's financial statements, again, without impacting the EDA budget. There is some information in this draft report that is incomplete, um, particularly with regard to retirement information. And that is because it is still being worked out for the county as a whole. And our report will then contain that portion of the information that is relevant to the EDA. Are there any questions from commissioners about this draft report this month? John, it's Kathy. I have one, just one quick question. You don't even have to answer it now, but I noticed as I was going through it, there were some areas that were highlighted in yellow. So I, I don't know whether there's something about those areas that it was something new or something changed, but it was just something that sort of jumped out at me. Um, of course, yes, good question. Those are areas that are not yet complete in the okay. draft. Okay. And a lot of those do indeed relate to the retirement information that is still in process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no other questions, let me move on to my second item. And this is our fiscal year 21 procurement guideline for the agency, for the authority. Um, as you know, we conduct procurement subject to the Virginia Public Procurement Act with the objective of encouraging open and competitive procurement to the greatest extent possible. Um, this guideline is specific to the EDA, um, but is in line with the Virginia Public Procurement Act. And we update it every year to incorporate any changes that the General Assembly has made to the code. Um, we have worked very closely this year with our legal counsel, Ashley Harrison of McGuire Woods. She is a colleague of Mike Graff's and she has tremendous expertise in Virginia public procurement. So she's been a great uh, assistance to us this year, especially as we've been through a lot of transition in our procurement um, staff. So um, tonight I'm asking for the commission to vote to approve and adopt this fiscal year 21 procurement guideline that um, is consistent with what other public bodies do and it will function as the board's approval of the processes that we undertake um, to implement the Virginia Public Procurement Act. This document also was sent out to the commissioners last week. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them before the vote. Any summary just on, on, on any major changes or what, what's the, the summary point on anything that changed or is this? Um... Yes, thank you. So there were not um, any major changes of significance in the code this year. However, we did a fairly substantial revision to this document because as you know, we um, engaged new legal counsel this year. And so Ms. Harrison's um, knowledge of Virginia public procurement led her to make a lot of suggestions to us in ways that I think simplify the, um, what we do. For example, the Public Procurement Act dictates the different methods of procurement or types of procurement that have to occur 
dependent on the do expected dollar value. And we have simplified and made our guideline even more in line with what the state law requires. Okay, so no major change to current internal process for how we acquire things. This is tightening up the document, is that basically what I'm understanding? Exactly, tightening it up, bringing it up to date, adding some details um, where needed to clarify things. But no major change to what we do. Our largest contracts are procured um, through a competitive negotiation method of procurement, and we use the Selection Advisory Committee comprised of several staff members. So um, again, in order to, to make the process as competitive as possible and encourage as much participation from the business community and the public as possible. Do we need a motion to approve this then? Is that what you're asking for, Donna? Yes, yeah, sir. we need a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second, this is Christian. Okay, uh, any further discussion? All right, Mike, would you do the roll call for us, please? Sure, Commissioner Deschauer. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Hainsworth. Yes. Vice Chairman Quigley. Aye. Chairman Lang. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Okay, Very thank fun. you. And I will come back to you in the future anytime there are changes in the code. Um, I would also like to let you know before I turn the mic back that we do have a new staff member at the EDA. We have hired Kay Harmony Smith as a procurement specialist. This position was vacant for about six months. So we're very happy to have her on board. And uh, most recently, Ms. Smith worked for Fairfax County in the Department of Human Resources. So she's got a great understanding of the county and administrative procedures. Great. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, as we move into the fall and think about the post COVID-19 economic recovery, sometimes it's hard to imagine. I wanted to bring in a series of thought leaders that would provide strategic vision for the future. I worked with Victor Hoskins and the executive team and came up with a group of speakers for this fall. We'll kick off the series tonight with Fairfax County Executive Brian Hill. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, he has pushed the county staff to be flexible and creative in the ways they deliver county services. For example, he sat down with leaders of the planning and development review team to develop innovative ways to continue inspections and permitting during the pandemic so that hundreds of millions of dollars in commercial and residential building projects could continue to move forward. He also worked closely with Chairman Jeff McKay and the Board of Supervisors to provide unprecedented assistance to businesses affected by the economic downturn created by the pandemic. These efforts have resulted in more than $40 million in grants being approved for more than 4,000 small businesses with fewer than 50 employees. The county has particularly focused on getting that assistance to minority owned, women owned and veteran owned companies and the vast majority of the approved businesses fall into those categories. By helping thousands of businesses, the county has saved thousands of jobs and our president and CEO says saving jobs means saving households and communities. In addition, Brian will discuss how the county and EDA staff have collaborated as never before. County Executive Hill will also share his vision for the next few years. A little bit about Brian Hill. The Fairfax County Board of Supervisors appointed him to be county executive in January of 2018. The county lured him away from James City County, Virginia, the Williamsburg area, where he was county administrator. He also has served as the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Operations at the University of South Carolina's Beaufort Bluffton campus, and as the Director of Finance for the University of Maryland's Office of Information and Technology, as well as Director of Administration for the Department of Aerospace Engineering. In his nearly two years, which I'm sure right now it feels more like 40 years as our county executive, 
Brian has been very supportive of economic development and the EDA. He supported our request for funding for a talent initiative, and he created the Department of Economic Initiatives. Uh, the county executive will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will have time after his remarks for some questions. Once again, welcome, Brian. Oh, mute. I was listening to Andrew. Thank you so much for that introduction. I uh, really appreciate all the communication and collaboration that we've shared over the last, believe it or not, almost three years. Uh, it's coming up. Uh, I, I have to say, um, going forward, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with your board, your chair, as you as being the chair, and Victor Hoskins obviously um, has brought a different type of tone and tenor to the EDA, and I do appreciate the collaboration that uh, Victor and I have. We do have some good times and banter back and forth, but it's always about business. Um, so I thank you all. Uh, Kathy Riley has uh, also been uh, a bright star, shining star for me. She's always kept me up and going when I get down, so I want to thank Kathy. I'm not sure if she's on the call. Uh, but I, I do want to thank the folks that uh, have helped me go through this past two and a half, sorry, two years, nine months, and, and uh, uh, 13 days. Um, I do want to say thank you. Uh, when, when we look at Fairfax County uh, going forward, oh, how can I forget James Quigley, the guy that texts me all the time? Can't forget James Quigley, sorry. Um, as, we, as we're looking forward into... Uh, of the future. I have to say that working with the EDA as well as the 51 departments uh, within Fairfax County, as well as the Fairfax County School District, working on our strategic plan has been the key and, the, and something that we have to continue to move forward. We have to figure out to prioritize our, our, our key initiatives as we move forward. About a year and a half ago, we decided that it was a good idea for us to do a little bit something different. We're doing a strategic plan uh, that everybody's been involved with. Uh, the, the strategic plan also allowed us to develop the Department of Economic Initiatives, and it was my pleasure to hire Rebecca Maudry to be the Director of Economic Initiatives. The focus of this department was not to be a department in competition with the EDA. Uh, I, I'm waiting for Chairman Lang to smile because we did have that conversation uh, prior to us spearheading that, that, new, that new economic department. In speaking with Victor, we were missing some certain things and small business was uh, some of the things we were missing. Uh, the connection, the connectivity, and the, and the ability for each and every department within Fairfax County, as well as EDA, to collaborate and work together to ensure that our small economic um, businesses were gonna maintain throughout Fairfax County. As you know, we have 200,000 businesses in the county. 93% uh, of them have 10 or less people. So we, we knew that there was gonna be a need for us to always be in tune with those, with those uh, business partners. Bringing on Victor Hoskins obviously brought a new light to the county uh, with, with all the things he did for Arlington, unfortunately, um, Amazon wasn't smart, but they still went to Arlington, but Victor, Victor brought them home. So uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Victor um, thus far. When you think about economic initiatives and you think about COVID, um, as the chairman has made a statement about our CARES Act funding, uh, we approximately put out $45 million for businesses. And, and we've helped a lot of businesses maintain and continue to move forward. Um, this, actually tomorrow, there will be another request for about $12,000 to support businesses that were not able to, we, we, we were not able to fund at that, at that juncture in the $45 million budget. So Rachel Flynn, as well, who is the department, sorry, who is the Deputy County Executive for Community Development, as well as um, Rebecca Maudry, who I believe is on this call, um, we put together a budget for another $12 million. The Board of Supervisors will approve that tomorrow. So of our, of our CARES Act funding, more than a quarter of it went 
specifically to economic development and to making sure that our business community can continue. Business community is the lifeblood of Fairfax County. 200,000, yes, but we have 11 Fortune 500 companies and Victor Hoskins and I have spoken to, I believe, seven of the 11 during the pandemic because we wanted to understand from your strategic standpoint, what could we do better in Fairfax County? One, to keep you here. Two, what can we do to help you grow here? <clears throat> and three, most, most importantly, we are here to listen to everything that you need, every thought that you have, and to see how we can work together with the advent of the Silver Line going into Loudoun County and the development spur down that corridor. It was very important for us to ensure that they understood where we were going, how we were going to get there, and more importantly, to let them know that Fairfax County is a different Fairfax County. We're here to listen and to talk, not to stop and prevent. Chairman Jeff McKay, who started as the chairman of the board in January, has said this to me and will always say this to me. I want a spry and a quick moving government. Uh, I don't want to cut corners, but I want to do things differently and I want to do it better. He didn't lure me from James City County, he stole me because his father, I, I just found this out, his father actually lived down there, was watching me for two years. If I would have known that, I would have screwed up because James City County is a great place uh, to live, work and play, but Fairfax County is absolutely a better place. And as you can see, we've done very good things together. So we talked about the strategic plan, but the one main thing that Jeff McKay was talking about and what he wants to bring forward is, is a one Fairfax and equity and access to all, for all businesses, uh, for our people to be able to, and when I say our people, all Fairfax County residents, to be able to have the opportunity to garner that access and that equity. As we continuously fund Fairfax County Public Schools, 52% of our budget goes to Fairfax County Public Schools. I say that today as I'm waiting for talking points on two of the two things that have happened over the last week uh, to Fairfax County Schools because the one thing I always tell Victor Hoskins is Fairfax County Schools has to be the premier has to be the premier school system. If I can have a premier school system, I, I as well as Victor, as well as you, everybody on this call, makes our life a little easier as we bring businesses towards Fairfax County. The, the, the great job that Victor and his team have done to get Microsoft to go up to 500 plus thousand square feet during a pandemic. Kudos to you, Chairman Lang, kudos to Victor Hoskins and kudos to all of the staff. But the, as I look at the future, Fairfax County Schools is going to be the key to us continuing to, for us to move forward. The challenges I see are, are, are quite interesting if you ask me because it's probably going to be challenges that you may or may not have heard of obviously uh, you've heard of revenue challenges and shortfalls with the governor with the with uh, richmond um, people don't realize that fairfax county is about 13 14 percent of the population for the commonwealth of virginia we're 24 percent of the net wealth and every time we send a dollar to richmond we get 22 cents back so we do a lot of heavy lifting for this Commonwealth. So revenues is going to be key. Obviously, economic recovery throughout the nation is going to be a big task for us. I mentioned schools, but the main thing that I think we need to really pay attention to is mental health. Parents are staying home with their children. They're actually asking them to be parents and they're having problems doing that. This online virtual schools, I'm not, pushing to be in class. I am not pushing for that at all. I'm not pushing for it all to be 100% virtual, but I am pushing for us to be a little bit more creative in how we provide education to all. I've asked my, my team to be very flexible in their work schedules. Uh, if you come here on a Sunday, there's just as many cars in our parking lots as you, if you came on a Monday through Friday. And that has been a testament to our team. We've been very flexible in how we've approached this. Uh, luckily for me, I have three children, all are in college. Unluckily, I'm paying for two of the three, but I don't have to do the virtual learning every day. I'm watching parents just pull their hair out, and I've been working with the superintendent to think differently and think bigger. I, I gave him a task 
to do things a little bit differently. You save a penny, you get a penny. A penny in Fairfax County is worth about $27 million. So those are the things that we've been working on as a team collectively. Because again, Chairman Jeff McKay has said he wants us to be spry and nimble and a little bit better and quicker in how we do things. LDS has stepped up, sorry, Land Development Services, I believe has stepped up. Victor and I went on the listening tour. We heard the, the Kappa Ones and the Fannie Mae's and everybody talking about how it takes so long for us to be uh, business friendly. I have to say this to you, little old James City County, Beaufort, South Carolina, I've never worked in a community that was business friendly when it comes to developers. Not, never happened. We're all, we all, we're all horrible government employees. However, going through our listening tour, I think it's starting to change a little bit in Fairfax County just by the fact that we're using technology. I always tell folks, change is good if you're the one spearheading the change, but when you're being told to change, that becomes a little bit of a problem. About a year ago, we started to make our change. Um, the, this pandemic has basically got in the way of some good things that we could have done. However, but it's also made us sharper and, and our thought process has had to change. Work, walking by managing has been a key. Working with Victor Hoskins has been a major key. Speaking to as many small businesses as well as the large Fortune 500 businesses has been a key. And I think you will see a difference in how we do business from EDA to LDS through Department of Planning and Development. We are just working at how to do things a little bit different, a little bit more nimble, a little bit more spry. I don't have much more to say tonight. Um, this is my 13th meeting. Uh, my administrative aide did not allow me to eat lunch. I've told Victor that I was gonna run through this very quickly. And if there were any questions, Rebecca Madre should be able to answer all of them. Correct, Rebecca? I don't hear her. So if we have any questions on where we are and how we're getting there, I appreciate it. But again, $57 million allocated to businesses in Fairfax County. 57 million, which is more than one quarter of our total CARES Act allocation. First of all, Brian, thank you for championing um, th this particular cause. And I know you, you, you guys went the extra mile to get another 12 million, I believe, sort of added to this to help. And it, it's predominantly going against businesses that, it, this is my understanding, but maybe you could set my mind straight here. It's predominantly gone toward businesses that we haven't always targeted as our, our biggest growth markets for, for Fairfax. We, you know, these aren't going to Microsoft, and, and yet that's been a huge focus of, of, of this institution here is to go uh, after those organizations of, of size and scope. That, uh, but uh, in this pandemic, especially, that the county has uh, made sure to focus on those businesses um, th that are incredibly important to the county. We need these businesses. We need these people back to work. Um, and it, 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 it certainly feels like you guys have done a long way toward making sure that we're looking at the entire economy. So I wanted to, to thank you for championing that cause and, um, uh, and, and, and getting that through so that we can support these types of companies. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And, and, and again, it, it's about us. We've done this together as a team. Uh, we, we're looking at everything possible. And with your support, as well as every community stakeholder support, from the nonprofits to the big business to the small mom and pop shops, you got to look at it from a holistic approach. This is Fairfax County. We're 409 square miles, not 109 square miles or not four square miles. I think that's Tyson's is four square miles, if I'm not mistaken. It's about Fairfax County. And if we don't have all the, the interlocking pieces that help support the big companies, we're gonna be in a whole heap of trouble. This is why I think we're ahead of the, ahead of the curve. Um, many of my compatriots throughout the, throughout the United States ask me, how in the heck did you get your board to allocate funding in that fashion? And I said to them, it was basically about just talking to them and showing them what, what our priorities should be and where we should be going. And then they were able to take it and say, no, we should be going in this direction, but I hear where you want to go. 
but co collectively we need to be here. And I said, that's great. As long as we have a plan, I'm good. And being able to pivot from that plan is even better. Hey, Brian, it's Kathy. You know, one thing that's near and dear to my heart is early childhood education. And I wanna thank you and the county for the support and the Office of Children. And I'm hoping that you and the superintendent are trying to figure out some creative ways to uh, deal with this issue. Because as you know, many of the early childhood education facilities are closed down. Some may never open. Um, I know at Fairfax Futures, we've been handing out sanitizer and different kinds of things to help the, the different um, facilities have what they need to be able to you know, welcome children. Um, so I, I don't expect an answer right now, but I think this is one of the keys to the, the situation is getting those children uh, in safe and, and healthy environments while their parents can go back to work, so. Yeah, you know, what's been fascinating, um, you know, this pandemic doesn't, doesn't tell you what's happening from day to day, but you have to be able to be a little bit more flexible and movable. Uh, what, what, and I believe it was May 20th, I announced that we were not gonna have summer camp because I couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, by July 13th, I, we had a summer camp, Camp Fairfax, and basically, that camp was only 17 sites. It's about 600 kids. But we had to do that because I needed to understand what we could do going forward. If I would have waited, if we would have waited and then been in school situation now, we wouldn't have known the protocols or the tests. And, then, and they, we didn't do it as a guinea pig, but we did it because we had so many people calling yeah. my office saying, Mr. Hill, please help us do something so we can get these kids out and about. So we did Camp Fairfax. September 8th, we started uh, SRS, which was schools returning, sorry, supporting returns to schools, 37 Title I schools. And that was more of a case to help with our achievement gap and focusing in on those individuals, those young people that needed the one-on-one -on -one help. I have to be honest with you guys, I might look old, I am. I cannot do this online learning thing. That is not my thing. I am a in class, in person. I need the teacher in front of me. I don't know how these kids are dealing with it, but we felt as though the kids that needed the help needed the, on, the in person teaching. And we have 37 sites throughout the county. And it was fascinating. Um, in, in one letter I received, you should not be doing this. It's not fair. And in the same letter, could you, could you add more sites? So I looked at the letter and I was talking to McKay and I said, you know, reading is fundamental, but I, I think this is like an oxymoron here, but we've got 37 sites of kids and we wish we could do more, but we don't have the staffing or the yeah. funding. Well, we're just gonna have to figure it out as we go along. I mean, and, and yeah, there's no magic bullet and we can learn the the country too that are doing some creative things, so. Well, the Thank one you. good thing I will say, uh, Chairman, is that we are getting so many calls from around the country, one for the way we presented the CARES Act funding and two for standing up uh, the support to return for schools. And now the school district is stating that they're going to be bringing back kids as early as October. Mm. You know, so it's a very quick change from schools weren't safe to, oh boy, the county's making this potentially look bad, potentially. We're going to start seeing how they're doing with their test protocols and we're going to work with our health officials to get us moving forward again if it wasn't safe we wouldn't be doing yeah, it of course uh, we're, not. we're trying to make the first thing i tell all the staff here in fairfax county family first and i want everybody safe that's it i, I want you to have safe weekends safe days i want your family to be safe so we would not be putting people in jeopardy and that's not what we do here in fairfax county thank you are there any more questions from the commissioners? Uh, hey, this is Christian. I had one. Um, hey, out of for the, hey, sir, how are you? County executive or deputy county executive, if you want to take a break. But thank you both <laughs> for your leadership during this unprecedented time. I was wondering, we uh, obviously following the work of our old colleague, Supervisor Lux, Lux, very closely. I know he's trying to get the innovation corridor started on Route 1. Is there any update? Um, either of you could provide on, on where that is at the moment? 
Yeah, there's there are some updates. I actually spoke with Supervisor Lust this morning about uh, getting a, a meeting. I believe it's on September 25th uh, with uh, with the community stakeholders as we move forward. Obviously, we bought properties um, down in the corridor, down Route 1. Um, he's looking for an emerging tech scenario. Uh, we are working with community stakeholders as well as some public-private partnerships who want to be a part of our process. Uh, I, I don't want to be the one to say where we are and what we're doing because I don't like taking it out of the supervisor Lust's hands because he is a supervisor, but I think we're going to have some neat, some neat things to, to, to put out there pretty soon, and I think he's going to be happy as well as yourself. Great. Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. Ryan, this is uh, Rachel Flynn, just to add that we've hired a consultant with the EDA joint venture, which we really appreciate, to look at the economic opportunities in that corridor, so the market study. And the firm is called PES, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. See, Rachel reminded me of that this morning, but I can't remember everything because my, my memory is starting to fade. There's so much stuff going on in Fairfax County and I can't keep up. That's why that's why I talk to Victor a lot. <laughs> but you all make a great team, so thank you. Thank I agree. You. Good teamwork. Okay, well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for being with us tonight. And really, if you need to go grab something to eat, by all means, do that. We want you to take care of your safety Brian, first. Brian, right. before you go, Brian, before you go, I want to say that um, you have put together an incredible team. Um, you know, Rachel Flynn, has been fantastic. Rebecca Moldry has been incredible. I mean, you guys are going through 6,000 applications right now and 83% of those businesses have less than 10 employees. You are working on, you're doing, the, you're doing God's work right now. You're doing missionary work. You're keeping people in jobs and you're saving households. And I appreciate that. And I, and I have appreciated all that the, the County Board of Supervisors and the chairman have done really to put these resources in place because no one else could have done it. And you guys did it. And I'm just proud to work with you, Brian. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that, but I got I got to say this to you, everybody on this call. No, I am no, I am not that good. It's that it's everybody around me that does it. And Victor, you know, we all say this the same. Uh, we get all the accolades, but I'm going to tell you, Rachel Flynn and Rebecca and her team are doing bang up work. And and it's funny, you know, I got a lot of heat for pitching the Department of Economic Initiative. A lot of heat. Well, you know, I don't mind heat. Uh, I, I, I like heat. I, 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 I just, we just do what we need to do. We, we, we figure out what needs to be done and we try to get it done as quickly, as efficiently as possible. Your help, uh, Rachel Flynn coming from Google, uh, Rebecca coming from the, the district. I mean, what more can I ask for? I got, we got great people working in Fairfax County and we just got to continuously push, pushing this envelope forward because I don't know when COVID's going to end. You know, I, I, on my podcast, I always say COVID-19, 20, and 21, and I came up with a new one, 60, and they were looking at me strange. I said, yeah, just add the numbers together. That's all. I, I, I do remember numbers, Victor. <laughs> hey, Brian, let us know if there's anything also that we can do. I know you're not shy, but as things evolve, certainly we are here, so... All, I, all I ask is for you to help us give us a landing hand. If we do something silly, Talk to us if we're doing it good. Promote the staff and tell them great job. Uh, this is a team effort, and this one Fairfax has to continue moving forward because without all the people on this call and the 1.2 million residents, we got a we got a tough road to go. So we might as well just get on board and do it together. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great evening, and if you have any other time, if you have anything you need from me, you know where to reach me. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Executive. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. So we're going to move on to our next agenda item. And this is a report on an office market survey and analysis that Executive Vice President Alex Iams is heading up. I will ask Alex to describe the project and why we're doing this. Alex. Thank you, Chairman Lang, and good evening, commissioners and, and guests. That's a that's a tough act to follow. Uh, the county executive and and his team very uh, excellent work, and so impressed by all of uh, the advancements we've been able to make during this challenging time. We recently engaged Brightline Strategies uh, through a competitive RFQ process to assess 
how COVID-19 is changing demand for office space really over the next two fiscal years. And the project comes to us at a pivotal time as we seek to understand the rapidly evolving market conditions that have been brought about by the pandemic. Brightline is conducting its analysis by connecting directly with commercial property decision makers at companies throughout Fairfax County and will complete the project over the coming weeks. We will use the results of the project to help align our performance metrics for jobs and square footage with the projected market conditions. We're pleased to welcome Brightline to the commission meeting this evening to share an update on the progress of the project, how they structure their analysis and the direction is headed. Uh, I think that you'll really enjoy what you're about to hear the, the team is very thorough in the way that they think about these things. There is, there's a lot of depth uh, and layers to the questions that they ask of the commercial property owners and, and the companies. Um, and they also are very thorough in terms of surveying the full landscape types of companies, whether it's size or industry sector. Um, and, and I think you're gonna appreciate what they have to say. Uh, and, and we look forward uh, to, to this project over the next few weeks. At this point, I'll hand it off to Kevin Hudak of Brightline to make a presentation and followed by a Q&A with the commission. Kevin? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for that great introduction. Really appreciate it and appreciate being here tonight with uh, commissioners and, uh, and guests. Uh, Alex stole my words when he mentioned that, uh, you, you know, County Executive Hill is a tough act to follow. I agree. Uh, I would say that one thing, though, is that you'll see in our survey that we have about 87% of uh, Fairfax County tenant decision makers who say that they're more likely to stay here in Fairfax County because of that $45 million loan program that we were speaking about. So there's already uh, quantitative data showing just the high favorability towards uh, what the county executive, his team, and FCEDA is working on. Um, you should see right now that I just shared my screen and appreciate you all following along tonight. We will have about 10 minutes for Q&A after the presentation, but any commissioners, uh, Kathy, if anyone has questions as we go through, feel free to stop me and I can definitely explain, but we will have some Q&A time. So just to introduce, I also have my colleagues, Michael Broder and James Moore on tonight, and they may step in and provide color or help with some of the questions that we receive as well. But just to uh, briefly introduce Brightline, we are a, a real estate research and strategy firm based in Old Town Alexandria, so here in Virginia as well. And we have been spending, since April and May, very deeply involved in COVID-19 research, examining the pandemic's impacts on all manner of industry, primarily commercial real estate, right, and speaking directly to commercial office tenant decision makers in surveys and focus groups and interviews, but we've actually been also studying retailers. We've studied multifamily apartment community renters uh, and also the real estate industry executives who are the opinion leaders and the, the business leaders who are in the industry. For the office tenant decision makers, you know, our method is a bit different as we not only just want to look at immediate views on the virus, but also some of the long term effects on their business dynamics. So declining revenue, increasing teleworking, what does talent recruitment and retention look like? And how are their business development pipelines holding up in the pandemic? We then speak to their perception of value in their physical office locations and their workplaces, whether it's Fairfax County or anywhere else in the DMV or the nation. And from there, we really go into their likelihood to reassess their space needs and as an extension of that, reduce or expand square footage. So everything we're working on is business dynamics first, what they're seeing in the field as business leaders and then their real estate decisions, because we believe that those foundational elements are important for understanding the resiliency of the county, the resiliency of, of the country when it comes to commercial real estate. So we've already conducted quite a few studies around this, uh, in addition to the one that we're currently working on with Fairfax County EDA. Back in April and May, we had completed what we call our phase one COVID-19 impact study, and that was conducted exclusively in the Mid-Atlantic region, and that included Fairfax County, and that's initially what started our conversation with FCEDA. We're currently in the field right now with a nationwide study, so we call that our phase two COVID-19 impact study, and we're conducting that in partnership with BOMA International, which is the Building Owners and Managers Association, and it's being sponsored by Yardi. Uh, which is an enormous real estate so uh, software platform for tracking tenant engagement, 
uh, hot and cold calls for HVAC, et cetera. Many of you who work in offices may have worked with Yardi platforms in the past. And we're actually at about a thousand or more responses on that study as well. And then obviously what we're gonna be discussing tonight is the Fairfax County Impact Study, which we've been fielding in parallel. And you'll see some times where I actually present some trend line questions. So questions that we asked in April and May and where those answers are now, right? Trendlining those responses. We also have uh, questions that we're asking in that nationwide study as well. So we can see how Fairfax County is comparing to our nationwide sample. So very quickly, just to go into what we've been working on for the Fairfax County EDA. So phase one, which we uh, completed in July and presented those results, really was looking at that first April to May study and drilling down exclusively on Fairfax County and the rest of Northern Virginia and comparing that to our overall mid-Atlantic sample. The idea was mapping the findings from the broad sample to county demographics and business statistics. That then helped us and informed what we're in right now, what we call a flash poll of Fairfax County office tenant real estate decision makers. So imagine we're going out and directly surveying 100 office tenant decision makers to understand their sentiments related to COVID-19, the business impacts, and how it may affect their space decisions moving forward, but also where they choose to locate their offices uh, when they have renewals coming up, when they're opening new and sat new satellite offices, et cetera. We're looking at the you know, county's economic performance, its resiliency, and any potential dampening impacts on the commercial real estate market's activity. What you're gonna be seeing tonight is what we're calling a preliminary output or an update on the impact study. We have about 80% of our recruit, but I would say that these findings may change as we finish up that recruit, as we fill out some of the industries and square footage tiers that we're looking for. And then obviously in coming weeks, as Alex mentioned, we will be combining these different research tools and secondary market data in order to model you know, the county's and, and business economic impacts, predict some of those future occupancy and vacancy rates, and even forecast the ability to gain rent premiums here in Fairfax County uh, for those owners and operators. So just to jump right into the data, so what you'll see here is one of the, the questions that we ask uh, this is not a question of will you renew or not renew, right? It's a lot more nuanced than that when it comes to COVID-19 and to the mission that we have from Fairfax County EDA. So this is more about asking questions you'll see in the bottom left there, right? It's not so much are you just going to renew or not renew, but will you be renewing your lease and staying in this office building? Will you be moving out of your current office property but staying in Fairfax County? Will you be moving out of your current office property and leaving? or might you even be shutting down? Given those options, we have 51%, so a majority of respondents would renew their lease and remain in their current office building. We then have a 32% group that's a bit more mobile, that they're considering moving out of their current office property, but still staying in Fairfax County. So that's a total of 83% who we can count on to remain in Fairfax County. And mind you, when we look at this sample, we target the office space decision makers. So C-suite, uh, executive VPs, senior VPs of real estate, uh, even some of those mid-level managers who are involved in committees that impact that decision. So that's 83% say they will remain in business here in Fairfax County. There's 12% who claim that they will be moving out of their current office property and leaving Fairfax County. And then 5% who may shut down their office footprint or may even end their business operations. What's important to note about this, we split the data out. You'll see in that middle for those key demographics, we split the data by role, by square footage, by industry. And in our final report, you'll see we split that out by a few more dem demographics as well. But most important, I look at the C-suite and owner group, right? Where you see 63% who are going to both renew and stay in their property. And then that other 19% who's going to renew, uh, but maybe stay in, in Fairfax County, right? So, Looking at square footage, one of the questions we had uh, earlier was this idea of the 25,000 to 50,000 square foot group. And we've been looking at that group. If you notice, 29% say they'd renew and stay in the property, but 57% say that they would stay in Fairfax County only. That's as far as they can go. When you look at that group, they're folks who are looking for uh, an intra-county move, right, within Fairfax County, for lower density, right? They're looking to move from a suburban urban environment to maybe a truly suburban environment. Uh, and that's what the data shows. They're also more likely to consider co-working and flex spaces 
as in we're going to reduce our square footage a bit, spread out socially distance in some of these co-working spaces. So it's an interesting group. What I'd note is that the most important thing is that sweet spot of 5,000 to 25,000 square foot users, you see that they are most likely to renew and stay in property and most likely to renew and at least stay in Fairfax County. I had mentioned this before when I was giving credit to FCEDA and County Executive Hill, but when you look at what actually attracts them to Fairfax County, we tested this towards the end of the survey, what's making you more likely to consider renewing in your property, renewing in Fairfax County? The number one positioning statement or fact that we test was this Fairfax County approving a $45 million loan program for small businesses and going above and beyond. Imagine 87% said that that is making us more likely to remain here in Fairfax County followed by us offering those big city resources, but with suburban urban density that actually keeps employees safe from COVID. And then the third most powerful message we tested was FFC initiating a talent initiative to recruit and retain young skilled talent in the area. Coming from a political polling background, I can tell you it's tough to get 80% of people to agree on anything, right? But the fact that we have 87%, almost nine in 10, saying that that $45 million loan program uh, is really helping to keep them here is significant. So things to pay attention to as we go through that 5,000 to 25,000 square foot uh, sweet spot. You'll see where they move throughout this survey. Moving to the next slide, this is all about what's driving their decision making when it comes to real estate, right? And again, we test this in an agree disagree format. So even though many see coronavirus as a key inflection point in workplaces, this doesn't mean that they're seeing less value in physical office space, right? When you go through, yes, you, know, you have that pool of about 79% who are saying, we'll likely stay more than 50% teleworking through the end of 2020, right? And that's significant because that tells me that a lot of companies are still keeping home, it's, it's still keeping at least 50% of their workforce at home. If you look down at that third message down or that third statement down, as a result of coronavirus, we'll be permanently reducing headcount or total employment. You're looking at about 78% there of county uh, tenant decision makers who are saying that they, that you know, to some extent we are considering some significant cuts in our workforce. And that final one I wanted to mention about density. We're looking to move our office to less dense, more isolated area. For example, moving away from Metro Proximate to less metro access, suburban urban to true suburban. So this is, I think, very important because just like I mentioned before with those 25,000 to 50,000 square foot tenants, they're the most likely to agree with that statement, looking for less density, right? And yes, it's a significant issue. And it's also in our nationwide survey, a significant issue, right? And while this can lead to that intra-county migration that I was talking about, it also presents a pretty unique opportunity for Fairfax County just because our nationwide survey is showing this move towards less density, I'm sure if you look in our, if you look at just the Washington DC CBD or any urban areas in DC, you're also gonna be seeing the same desire for less density, right? Which is perfectly positioned for Fairfax County to seize and other counties in that DC Metro Beltway collar, which do offer some of those suburban urban and suburban environments. So I pay attention to that density conversation um, you know, as, as a bit multifaceted there. On the right, we asked about their perceived value in the physical office space. So yes, while coronavirus is an inflection point for workplaces, we see that 63% today are seeing more value in their physical office space than they did before. Why this is so significant is that when we went back and we recut that April to May data, Granted, that April to May data was in the heat of the initial wave of cases, right? Uh, March 16th or March 13th was the famous press conference with President Trump where uh, some, some of these closures and lockdowns were first being announced. So we fielded that initial study right in the heat of things. If you look at that red value there, views flipped, 68% when we did that survey, were seeing less value in their physical office space. And that's of Fairfax County only. Today, 63% are seeing more value in their physical office space. So there's been a flip as folks have had a bit more time to absorb the news and get used to teleworking, but also recognize that we can't telework forever and that we do need to be in person for coaching, mentoring, talent recruitment and retention, 
that there's many reasons that we need to get back to the office place in a safe, effective, and efficient manner, right? So those attitudes have flipped. So even though it is an inflection point, the fact that we have folks seeing more value in physical office space does lend a bit to the, to, to the argument that office spaces and these footprints will emerge uh, stronger in the post-coronavirus world, these businesses will as well. Now, this is the initial uh, read in terms of square footage, right? And we've, as we've discussed, we'll be going through and in our analysis phase, actually come back with some forecasting around square footage and space needs. What you see is that 81% of the sample of Fairfax County decision makers are likely to reassess their space needs. The way this question was asked is how likely are you to reassess your space needs based on business impacts from the coronavirus COVID-19 public health emergency, whether it's based on more teleworkers, revenue declines, et cetera. So we've jumped up quite a bit. Now, that's also higher than our nationwide study today. When we look at our nationwide sample that's still rolling through, as is the Fairfax County data, we're at about 65% nationwide. So Fairfax County is a bit ahead of that nationwide sample in terms of understanding that we are going to be reassessing space needs, whether that's more space for accommodating social distancing, less space because we are having some of these business dynamics. And then 7% are unsure and 12% are unlikely. On the right is what the space reductions might look like or space expansions. So imagine the question on the right was asked only of those who said that I'm likely to reassess my space needs or I'm unsure. So that's 88% of the sample. When asked this question with percentages, you essentially have 31%. So real quick, the red bar is April and May 2020's data. So that's the recut data from the beginning of the pandemic. The blue bar is Fairfax County only, but August, September. So the study that's fielding currently. And then that gray bar was the rest of Northern Virginia from the April and May study. So looking at this, you have 31% of Fairfax County tenant decision makers who would actually expand or not change their footprints. You then have 65% who would actually reduce their square footage. And you can see the different gradations or amounts that they would reduce. When you do that kind of simple math of 65% of the 88% who said they were, who were asked this question, you come to about 57% of those in our sample who say that they would reduce their square footage. Now this is up from 48% in that April and May study. So we are heading in the direction, at least amongst our sample, of more space reductions. And a lot of where this is coming from are the 1,000 to 5,000 square foot tenants. So the smallest, and those are the small businesses that are having some trouble keeping up given the business dynamics, right? But they are a numerous, uh, there are numerous tenant population in the county. It's also coming from the uh, 50,000 or more tenants, right? So the largest of the tenants who have a big footprint are focused in that 10 to 50% space reduction range. We're actually seeing some strength in that sweet spot I mentioned before. So if you're in that 5,000 to 25,000 square foot range, you're actually at 44%. I'll be growing or not changing my space if you're a 5,000 to 10,000 square foot. And you're at 38% for that 10,000 to 25,000 square foot user. So there's still that, that good sweet spot. And again, when you look at who's reducing, it's the smallest and the largest of the tenants. So that's who we'll be focusing on in our analysis as well. So just looking in terms of <clears throat> what's driving it, what are some of these business dynamics? So the recode of the April and May data that we completed suggested that Fairfax County Enterprises saw some deeper coronavirus impacts than the rest of Northern Virginia, right? Since then, we now have more tenants in the county saying that they either have or could struggle to pay office rent or make payroll. When you look at the way we ask this question, we try to give this a longer tail and even forecast by asking them what applies to you today and what could apply to you in the future. That's the blue bar. And then the green bar is it doesn't or won't apply. What I pay attention to are those two bottom ones. So we've struggled to pay our office rent on time or meet our lease terms. So 40% said that that would apply to them today. 39% said that could apply in the future. And notice as the sum of applies or could apply, 
We're now at 79%, up from 64% back in April and May. The struggling to meet payroll requirements, it's 36% applies to us today, 39% could apply in the future, 75% total today, up from 68% in April to May. So a smaller increase there, but still something to pay attention to. What I think is important is that despite having some of these struggles, right, today, remember it's four in 10 who say, yes, that would apply to, to, to us today. We still have those folks saying there's more value in the physical office space. While there may be some reductions, there is still more value. Fairfax County is still an attractive location with 83% wanting to remain here, if not more. So again, they're still placing great value and importance in their location in the county and also value in their physical office space. And you, when you look at the nationwide numbers that we have, renewal rates in building are not as high as they are here in Fairfax County. And I would keep that in mind as well. So this is our final slide for tonight. This is all about the revenue that these Fairfax County enterprises uh, have and are predicting for 2020 and beyond. So what you're looking at here is we asked these decision makers, essentially, some have said the way we introduced the question was that some have said that coronavirus will impact their revenue versus forecast negatively. Others have said because there may be some pent up demand or economic improvement that your revenue may actually go up. This is really good news for Fairfax County because while there is still that struggle to potentially pay rent, meet lease terms, particularly amongst those small businesses, when it comes to their future state revenue forecast, they are significantly more optimistic than they were in April and May 2020, right? Previously, imagine we had 40% higher revenue, 46% lower revenue. So we were net negative six. Now in this, April, in this August and September study, we're at 57% higher revenue, 31% lower revenue. So we're seeing that climb in revenue versus forecast. Again, it shows that they are predicting a stronger Q3 and Q4 than they may have anticipated. But I also believe in reading this question, some of the tenant decision makers were looking at post coronavirus almost, right? Which may be a bit longer tail, but they were thinking what my revenue would look like pre coronavirus, in coronavirus, and then post coronavirus, right? And when you look at where those revenue curves are higher, it tends to go up as you, as you improve in square footage, right? So as you increase your square footage, that higher revenue goes up. And remember we said there was some risk amongst those 25,000 to 50,000 square foot tenants, right? But ultimately many of them are optimistic that that revenue will not be as much a factor. It's also a bit higher as you look at those C-suites and owners and some of those mid-level managers, also for technology companies and professional services companies, right? But again, those smaller tenants, the 1,000 to 5,000 square foot users, it shows why it's so important for that $45 million small business loan program and why the talent initiative is so important because those are the folks who were hurting in April and May and are continuing to hurt quite a bit. And so the expansion of that program is super important. But otherwise, what I see here in the data so far, and we'll be continuing our analysis, is a set of county decision makers who did feel that initial pinch and had that, those doubts around their physical office space but now they understand the importance of the location, the importance of their properties, right? They may be looking at decreasing square footage and that 26 to 50,000 tenant may become a 10 to 25,000 square foot tenant, right? But in the end, they do predict strong business performance. So I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, Victor, Kathy, Alex, others who wanna uh, chime in and provide some color and, and my colleagues, Mike and Jamie, but happy to answer questions fielding uh, and preliminary data and update, uh, but that we will be uh, preparing our final report and our final forecasts. Great, thank you, Kevin. And um, I will turn it back over to Chairman Lang to facilitate Q&A with the commission. I think what we just heard there is that, that one size certainly does not fit all when it comes to this situation. Uh, there, there are a lot of moving parts and it's, it's really interesting to watch the trajectory of the sentiment play out um, even between you know, the late spring and now. And, and we, knowing that we'll be getting some additional data in the forthcoming weeks. Uh, Chairman Lang? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is an amazing report. And um, we certainly, um, it's a lot to take in and to think about what the implications are. I do have a question down here. I see where you're doing some industry analysis. Will there be more of that as your results come out? 
because certainly there are certain industry sectors that are our strongest sectors. And I'm just wondering how that might come out in your report. Yep, so we'll definitely be having industry breakouts. Uh, what you see there is a roll up uh, into five or six categories, but we actually have a wider roll up available too. And as we complete our sample and fill those, we'll have healthier cell counts in each of those to be able to make some generalizations about some of the key industries. So we'll definitely be preparing that. I mean, this is totally anecdotal, but I think that the government contractors certainly are, I don't know whether they're going to move out of their buildings or not, but their revenues have been pretty strong. So, you know, that's, it'll be interesting to see what they're thinking about in terms of space as it relates to their industry, as their, their performance. Sure. And, and what we've heard too, uh, you know, uh, Kathy, with, with great intel from you as well, is that you know, those government contractors, it's sussing out in our survey and in intuition, they tend to be in that 25,000 to 50,000 square foot range. And they may be some of the key to kind of enhancing our position with that, that group. Because remember, the sweet spot is at five to 25. We are a bit weaker with 25 to 50. So I'd be interested in, in really examining that, that, uh, that strata of, uh, of, of, of user. And then also, um, you know, obviously breaking it down by industry. So that's, that's great advice. And the only other thing is transportation, you know, where, you know, so much of what we whined about for years is, you know, the traffic around here. And I'm just wondering whether this will look at any of those shifts that may occur, especially as they're looking possibly for less dense areas, maybe not near a metro, for example. Yeah, it's interesting because we asked that question about the suburban. So um, would you want to shift to a less dense location? And based on feedback from Stephen and Alex, we changed that question a bit to include the metro access. I don't know if you caught that when we went through. And, you know, what you can see there is that 64% say that's, that's uh, more attractive, right? 35% strongly. We okay. also ask a question in the survey that we haven't presented here about quality of commute and traffic and how that impacts their decision to uh, consider, prefer, choose Fairfax County and pay a premium for an office here. And I'd be, uh, I'm interested to see how that ends up sussing out um, in terms of the, the, the level of impact on their decision. Thank you. What other questions do we have, uh, commissioners, for, for Kevin and his team? Kathy, Ron, I have one. Um, yes. Thank you, Kevin, for a great presentation. Uh, how much uh, additional work you will have to do before you complete your study? That's question one, and then I have a follow-on. Excellent. So <clears throat> we're still in the field. We're still looking to recruit another 20 or 30 Fairfax County businesses into the sample, right? And I predict that we should be able to finish that uh, by next week. And then what we're going to do is prepare a full report based on the primary data, but then we'll also blend that with secondary market data uh, in terms of counts of these enterprises, and the total square footage that they have and start making those forecasts around really the, the, the you know, the, the real estate market resiliency for fiscal years 21 and 22, right? And what that retention, that, that tenant retention within Fairfax County looks like. And so um, how do you imagine the accumulation of these greater data sets could be used by EDA to promulgate some economic policy going forward. Yeah, so I'm happy. So I, I don't know, Mike, if you had, yep. or Alex, if you wanted to talk about its usage, one of the things that we took into account doing this is testing those positioning statements where we had about six or seven uh, facts about Fairfax County to understand what folks are most responsive to. That's where you saw the 87% who said, I'm more likely to consider and stay here because of the $45 million loan program. There's other statements and other factors that we test throughout the survey, which could potentially help inform that process. Uh, Alex or Mike, I, I heard someone speaking up too to, to answer Ron's question. Yeah, I think while the data perhaps gives you an understanding of the landscape and certainly as we complete the, the recruit, the, the level of depth and granularity we'll be able to provide across industry segments and, and different demographics uh, of the business community in the county. More importantly is actually how we apply the data using some predictive analytics to model the economic impacts 
that may be facing the county as a result of the pandemic, um, and also what opportunities, path to growth opportunities you have at your disposal. So when you start to think about programs and community engagement, particularly among the business community, what are the things that actually move those proverbial needles so that you can prioritize your investment, your engagement around the very areas that are shown to yield the results you seek and need to drive resiliency of the county and future performance to uh, post pre-pandemic levels. In other words, you were on a strong growth trajectory before the pandemic. How do we not only return to those levels, but also exceed them? So a lot of what will come out of the analytics is, is that type of insight that you can then deploy around programming or other types of engagement platforms to assist the community. Because mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, the, the utility of the data is measured in great part about how we can utilize it going forward and impact it will be, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So and and Alex, yep. No, oh, thank you for the question, Ron. Alex, did you have anything to add to that? Just, just two things. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're going to use it to help inform, uh, you know, where the bar is set for us on, on our jobs and square footage over the next two fiscal years with things evolving as, as quickly as they have been. Second, I, I think it really speaks to um, where, where do we focus our efforts on retention? Um, you know, you look at where are the pain points among these businesses of, of certain sizes and industry, and it can help us uh, focus, you know, our outreach to, to certain categories of business um, or, or certain size types. And then there's the inbound side. I think we're learning this, what tenants in this type of are looking for. Um, and if there are tenants out there who are looking for more suburban who may, you know, be in a different type of, of market right now or may want a presence here, uh, that will inform us as well. Uh, and we do have the option of, of exploring that dimension further. Well, Kathy, my, my final comment on this, and I'll, I'll probably address this to Victor. I think at the end of the day, when the study is completed, uh, if we as commissioners get a sense of, of what Victor and his team has in mind going forward as how we might apply, uh, you know, the wonderful results we get from Kevin and his team's work, I think that'd be really fantastic. Thank you. I think that's an excellent point. We will do that. Okay. I'm sure Victor's thinking about that too. Yep. He's nodding his head, so I assume you agree. You see it. So, James, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, your last slide. Can you go to the last slide for a moment? Is that um, <clears throat> is that that those numbers off on the left? Is that against their original plan, or is that their growth rate that they're expecting to have? Just overall revenue growth. Um, it, it, it read to me higher revenue expected against plan, but I, I, I can't tell if that's, that, that's the revenue forecast for overall growth. Is that correct? So that is the revenue forecast. So the way the question was asked, and that's a great question, James, is essentially where do you think your revenue for the year will be versus forecast come end of year? The way okay. it was asked was some commentators and company leaders have said their future state revenue versus forecast will take a dip as a result of the coronavirus, while others say there is pent up demand that will come in after the worst of the crisis is over. Where do you think your revenue for the year will be versus forecast come end of year? Got it, okay. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, we looked at it as when we were drafting the questionnaire as a 2020 forecast versus what you think actual revenue will be. I think with some of the language around, while others say that there's pent up demand that will come in after the worst of the crisis is over, I think some of the decision makers are looking at uh, going into Q1 2021, Q2 2021 with this question as well. So some folks said it, they took it to be more, you know, when the worst is over, potentially oh, after okay. the winter, spring next year, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was gonna, surprised by the, the, the fact that 57% of companies are saying their revenue is going to outperform uh, expectations. That's mm -hmm. sort of how I read that. But, but if you're saying that, hey, when this is done, uh, and, and, and it could eat up pent, pent up. And what I'm trying to figure out from all of this is just, uh, hey, our, uh, our, our revenues impacted. Cause I, I, so I'm the CEO of one of the companies in, in one of your, I think I'm in your 25 to 50 K mm -hmm. range, I, I think. Um, and uh, we look at it sort of two ways. And I sort of, in, in your final report, I'd love to, to, to see if you guys are thinking of it this way. One is, um, we absolutely looking at uh, uh, reduced heads, which you said a, a very large percentage of companies went through. That was associated 
mostly with uh, reduced revenues, right? Or reduced revenue plan, uh, in, in, at least during this time period. And a lot of companies may be using it as an excuse to, to tighten things up, or is it really against revenue? So that, that's one piece that we're, I'm trying to even think of it modeling my own way. So, hey, reduce revenue, you need less people. And, mm -hmm. and obviously you've seen some of that. The second piece though is, we're seeing an artifact within my own company is, most technology companies, uh, or pardon me, I should say it differently. A lot of technology companies who can work from home are now making the decision here locally to, to put off going back to the office mandatory until July of next year. We, we're about to make that announcement. We, we've seen a lot of big tech companies do that, and mainly because parents need an option to you know, stay home during this next school season too, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. The longer we go, we've been doing, um, consumer sentiment within our own company about people working from home or having an option post all of this to work from home in the future, even if we were 100% on site uh, before COVID. We are seeing that there are some people who want an option of, of a hybrid, but we are as well uh, coming to the realization that more and more of our employees want a hybrid option. I can tell you, the combination of those two things, a reduced headcount because of revenue impact, and two, we're just seeing that more and more people want an option post-COVID to, to, to be able to work from home, whether full-time and or part-time. We see that that's going to impact things between this time period of people coming back. And I, I'm wondering, as you guys are modeling this, I could tell you our company, how we're approaching is we're, we, we, we're, um, absolutely going to be taking less space. We're, and we happen to be in a, in a renewal period too. Um, um, one of the interesting data points we've been going is we're owned by a, uh, we have a, you know, we're majority owned by a very large PE firm and they're running the same strategy across all 110 of their major platform companies. And they sort of made the mandate that none of those companies can sign a renewal. You know, it's, I don't know, uh, uh, eight billion, ten billion dollars worth of market cap amongst those yeah. companies, uh, without considering those two options that we talked to, and every single company in the portfolio let go of people uh, to some degree. So we we definitely know that piece, and we also know from consumer sentiment across those hundred and ten major platform companies, which represent a whole bunch of sub companies too, that almost all of them are going to give a partial hybrid option long term to at least some part of the workforce. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting as you guys are looking at that, those two options, I don't know if, if you've seen consumer sentiment amongst workers wanting to, well, maybe I can work from home. And, I'll, and by the way, I'm gonna have figured it out because I'm now spent more than a year working from home. And so now I've figured it out. So maybe, I, maybe I'll spend 50% of my time working from home or 80% of my time working from home. Have you, do you see that this is getting cumulative as more and more time that, we figure out working from home uh, and, and how do you compare those two components, the layoff longer term and just that people are going to figure out working from home against the footprint of offices. This is uh, James Moore, Kevin's colleague. Uh, I would point uh, all of the folks on this uh, Zoom uh, to a study that was just released today. It was in the Washington Post that ENY did on behalf of the Greater Washington Partnership. And uh, exactly to the spirit of, of your previous comments, uh, the study mirrors exactly what you've seen in your own company and in the network uh, run by the PE, um, but also sort of traces some of that consumer sentiment because ultimately it seems that now that we're six months in, uh, employers are mostly reacting to their own workforces, and that's what we've seen in, in some of the other studies that we've done. Uh, and it, it ties in, you know, with what you mentioned before about uh, people looking for hybrids. Uh, it's very difficult to do one size fits all. Um, some workers obviously have commutes that are impacted. Some have kids at home, other family situations. So I. I I think all of these elements are kind of consistent. Yeah, and, and James, to your renewal point too, I just wanted to point out that in our study, we show that the longer your renewal is out, the less intense you are about square footage reduction as well. And so, uh, you know, and, and it, when you look at it, uh, folks who believe that they'll be, you know, that they're, they're in the renewal period three to four years from now 
are much less likely to say that they believe they'll be reducing their square footage on that renewal. Whereas those who are close to renewal, like you are, James, are a bit more intense and also have a, a, a larger uh, footprint reduction. So that tells me that many of these folks might be seeing that longer term horizon where things may return to normal with maybe this hybrid approach uh, included, but that their square footage needs will be the same you know, as today. But I thought that's a great point, Jamie, and thanks for bringing up the Greater Washington Partnership Study. Uh, and uh, we can certainly provide that link to folks after the, after the call. Will this flash poll presentation be available to the commissioners? Kevin, is this, is this presentation available to the commissioners now or is this considered still draft? So this is still considered a draft in progress, but I defer to uh, Kathy, Alex, Victor, and others in terms of the logistics. Yeah, I think, you know, by way of sharing it with you tonight, uh, we're happy to push it out to the, to the commission just with that caveat that we're still in progress. Sure, absolutely, that'd be appreciated, thank you. So hold it close. I have a question. As we get closer to, um, the actual outbrief and then having the EDA make decisions with the data kind of related to Ron's comment earlier. It's healthy for us to understand where things were correlated to the, the business questions correlated to the intentions that were mentioned relative to footprint going forward and where there were inverse correlations that as part of the study you all made decisions about so that we can understand where those clear line of sight um, correlations occur and where they're not there and interpretation occurred. Um, as we then have the EDA use the data and help drive decisioning. Sure, can certainly do that. And uh, we also have some open-ended questions that we ask in the study where it's more of that qualitative and we call it anic data right? Uh, but then there's also going to be those clearly quantitative, uh, strong statistical evidence-based correlations that we can highlight versus some of that, that anecdote, as we call it, Lenny. I think that's a great point, and, and thank you. And I apologize, I'm looking this way because I have you all on screen to my left, and so... No worries, I have that same problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. I just think this is going to be an evolving process for us to understand where there'll have to be some comparative work done on an ongoing basis so we can really see what, you know, what we've learned from the data and whether it actually has, you know, what, whatever we thought was going to occur has occurred. So we probably yep. need to think about how to do that. Chairman Lang, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, one of the things that we uh, talked about early on when we engaged this group is that we didn't just want this to be one data point, that we needed to look at it again in a quarter and then within another quarter and then within another quarter. So this, so these analytics will, will develop trend lines and we know that the scene, we know that things are gonna change. I mean, they, they change every couple of weeks. Um, you know, is there a vaccine? Is there not a vaccine? You know, is there a treatment for this? You know, as, as, as it evolves, as the, as the physical dimensions of the pandemic evolve and strategies for coping with it are more accepted. I mean, I got to tell you right now, everyone, everywhere I go now, people wear masks and, and that's not the way it was six weeks ago. So I think that what, what's changing is our behavior and in relationship to that, the outcomes. And as our behavior changes more, the outcomes change more. I'm not surprised that people went from, oh no, I'll never be in space to, um, you know, hey, I think this space has some value. I, I, always, I always use the, uh, the example that, you know, after 9-11, I had friends tell me they would never fly. And, and there were more people on planes uh, before COVID hit than ever before in the history of man. Um, they also, was, the people told me that they'd never build another tall building ever again in the United States or anywhere. Uh, there were more tall buildings built after 9-11 than ever before in the history of man. So our outcomes aren't necessarily what we expect them to be. The pandemic of 1918, two years later, remember the 1920s, they called them the roaring 20s. Um, the, what, what we do as humans is, is, is so different and we have to monitor it. Um, we, we try to have a realistic view of this. What we're trying to do is ultimately um, put our, hang our hat on a couple of numbers square footage and jobs. That's what we have supposed to deliver, square footage and jobs. We wanna know how this pandemic is affecting those two numbers. Yeah. But before you get to those two numbers, there's a lot of calculus. Mm -hmm. It's not math, it's gonna come down to math, but there's a lot of calculus. 
And calculus and differential equations are very different to, than, you know, one plus one equals two. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to take this calculus and boil it down to a couple of very, you know, straightforward data points. So um, it's, it's a very, I think it's an incredibly elegant way uh, to get at the answer because it's not guessing. Um, I, there are a lot of people out there just doing gut check guessing. That to me is inappropriate. That's like flying a plane without, you know, instruments. Doesn't make any sense. Um, so I'm really excited about the fact that we are going to do this on a quarterly basis. So I'm glad you brought good. that up, Chairman. Good, good. Because I see the power of this as a baseline. Okay. Any further, any further questions? Hey, Kathy, one, one quick question. Yes, Kevin, um, in the other category, is education or higher education at all in the mix of industries you're looking at? Yes. So great question. We do ask that, we do have that involved, and uh, I can definitely provide uh, some of the counts and information on that when we do our final report. So we do ask education, we ask nonprofit, we ask government okay. contractors, okay. we have hospitality, retail in there. Um, so it's, it's a list of about 15 to 20 different industry classifications. And then, uh, in fact, in the other uh, folks can actually write in their industry if it's not represented on the list. Great, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, and to your entire team. We look forward to uh, getting the final results and an ongoing dialogue uh, as, we, as we work through this, uh, this time that we're in. Um, so thank you very much. And now what I would like to do is uh, I'm going to give my report. As I mentioned earlier in the evening, uh, I'm working with Victor and the team we're, we are bringing some thought leaders to our meetings uh, on a monthly basis. I think this will be very important for us to hear what people are thinking, especially as we're going through these changings, changes. And, and also, there will always be time for us to, to do the business of the, of the EDA. We have several speakers slated for the next few months. Uh, in October, we are delighted uh, to have confirmed Dr. Gregory <coughs> Washington the first African-American president of George Mason University. He will come and present to us. He will discuss the amazing vision that he has for George Mason University Tech Campus. And moreover, Dr. Washington will provide an overview of how the various campuses will serve the overall system and he'll lay out his focus on working with technology companies in Northern Virginia, which of course is very important to us. And especially as it's related, Mike Bat, to the talent pipeline. Uh, at the Mason Tech Campus. Was Dr. Washington will also share how the EDA Mason are coordinating our efforts to bring talent to private sector companies. So it's, it, he, I don't know if any of you have met him, but he's, he's terrific, he's very dynamic, and we are just really fortunate to have him. In November, we have slated Stephen Murray, and I'm thrilled to have Stephen. I've always wanted to hear Stephen talk. I've read a lot about him. He's the president and CEO of Virginia Economic Development Partnership. He'll provide a vision for, Commonwealth, for the Commonwealth. Since Stephen joined the state, the Virginia business climate rankings have improved and the strategic focus has become clearer. Mr. Murray will talk about how Northern Virginia and the entire state economy is geared toward the focus of the tech talent pipeline and growing all the state's regional ec economies, of which of course we have many in the state. And then wrapping up in December, we would like to bring in Holly Sullivan, Global Economic Development Director at Amazon to talk about how important a tech talent pipeline is to her company and the entire tech industry. In addition to an update on the status of Amazon HQ2, we anticipate that Holly will lay out how Virginia Tech and the GMU Tech campuses are critical to high growth tech companies throughout Northern Virginia and the greater DC area. So that's the lineup. And I would also ask commissioners if there is someone that you would like to bring forward in 2021, let's, let's take a look at that. Um, we would like to have an inclusive, diverse set of speakers to come and share their perspective. And as you can see, we want them from different vantage points. So please be thinking about that. Um, a second part of my report for tonight is that we are making some progress on the one-on-one -on -one meetings that we're setting up. 
stay tuned. Uh, it's a process trying to get your schedules together with the schedules of the different supervisors. We are making some progress and uh, probably in the next week or so, we will have a final list of who's gonna be meeting with whom. Hopefully those of you that have already, we've set up meetings with the specific supervisor, you know about it, but um, we will have that laid out shortly. And I will be working with Victor and the team on key messages and how we want to approach each of the supervisors. Um, and certainly listen to them and hear what's on their mind because that's a key ingredient to this these meetings and finally uh please mark your calendars for february 19th it's a friday for our retreat uh i don't know how long it's going to be so just mark the day uh probably will be by zoom uh but we will we will we will see but i'd just like you to hold that date uh february February 19th. And with that, any questions or comments? Thank you. I would like to now turn it over to our president. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Lang. <clears throat> um, it's, it's late. We've been on for about an hour and a half, and that's a long time. So I'm going to make this more like headlines. Um, it's been a very busy couple of weeks. Uh, this, the first slide that you'll see um, is a slide about our one year anniversary for uh, the no Northern Virginia Economic Development Alliance. Um, we have been very fortunate that we've had a lot of progress in a very short time. Um, just some of the, the highlights, we've created um, actually a single brand website, uh, Nova EDA. Um, each individual jurisdiction has its own uh, profile in there. Um, and it's connected to um, things like um, income calculators and selecting your community and all the kinds of things that people look for um, when they're looking at an area. It's really received a lot of great reviews. I think we're up to like 20,000 or so uh, hits uh, a month. So we, we feel good about the traffic. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, we also um, have done a number of talent initiatives. Um, of course, we've, we've done the, the three um, virtual career fairs that have gone extraordinarily well. Um, and in addition to that, we've supported other jurisdictions on Go Virginia applications. Uh, for example, the biotech application that uh, Prince William County put out, Cyber One that Arlington put out. But what we've been trying to do is work together and, and co-support one another. Of course, you all have heard of since, the, since COVID started, we put together a 12 installment workshop series. Um, and I think what's really most powerful about all of these things that we've done we would have never been able to do them had we not had this alliance. And when we started this alliance, there was no COVID. But COVID-19 really accelerated our ability to work together and the, and the type of things that we could do together. And we've all benefited for it. And I guess I have to end with this one, which is the one that really kind of surprised me. Today, in the Alexandria Economic Development Partnership newsletter, there were three events that had Fairfax County economic development on them. Now, if that's not collaboration and cross-marketing, I don't know what else it is. I was very pleased about that. Next slide, please, Andrew. So um, we've been very busy in terms of um, working our international um, connections. And um, actually, um, our, one of our team members, um, Andrew, worked very closely with um, one of our, our, our Korea office to actually connect us with a reporter at um, Forbes Japan to do an interview on Arlington County, I mean, on, on Fairfax County. And what I ended up doing was not just talking about Fairfax County, but talking about all of Northern Virginia. Um, and it really came out, it was a really nice article. I do not read Japanese, uh, so they were kind enough to translate it into English. And uh, it was, it's really a very, very positive article. I was, I was very pleased with, with how it turned out. I, I wanted to end this, one slide with uh, something that he asked me at the end. The reporter asked me, he says, so what is your vision for Fairfax County? What do you see as a future of Fairfax County? And this is what I said. I said, first of all, it's not a vision for Fairfax County. It's a vision for all of Northern Virginia. And I said, and that vision is a very simple one. I said, we will be the innovation technology center for the Western hemisphere. I said, that is the vision. That's what we're going after. Um, and he chuckled and he said, why not the world? I said, well, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> so, 
So I figured the Western Hemisphere, and that wouldn't offend him. So <laughs> next slide, please. Um, one, of the, one of the great events that we had this month was with the Hispanic Chamber, um, the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber. This chamber actually serves suburban Maryland, D.C., and Northern Virginia. Um, we were very fortunate in that we were part of a panel, and I had the opportunity to talk about the resources, obviously, in, in, uh, in Fairfax County, but I, actually I really talked about all the uh, resources in all of Northern Virginia, which are many. Um, we've all together cumulatively have impacted thousands of companies um, in Northern Virginia, and mostly small companies. Um, I mentioned the work of Rebecca Modry and her team, um, the, de the Department of uh, Economic Initiatives. They have done a brilliant job in executing uh, their, their, lo their loan, initially loan program, but now grant program. There are over 6,000 applications in right now. I think about 4,000 have already been approved um, for grants. and. Uh, with this $12 million that has been added uh, to the uh, original $48.5 million, it'd be almost $58 million, it will actually serve every qualified business that applied. And I think that is phenomenal. Um, and if you look at the statistics on um, minority and women-owned business, um, the, the numbers are actually in the, the high 60s, um, which is very impressive. And that means that uh, we really made an effort to reach um, small and minority businesses, actually with workshops like this one here. Uh, next slide, please. This event involved India. As I mentioned, we are really working very hard with our international offices. They are on our call every Monday morning, and that has really changed the pace at which we work. Uh, Juhi, uh, from, uh, who's the assistant director of our uh, international business investment team, actually helped put this, uh, this event together. Uh, it was fantastic. It was with the um, the state of Karnataka, and that state is where we actually have our office presence um, in, in India. And that state also has a big defense and aerospace industry, um, so, we, so we obviously put that on a table. And believe it or not, we were actually on this event with the state of Indiana. So uh, I thought that was a very interesting um, situation where we were actually competing more like co-opetition because Indiana is a very different market, obviously, than the state of Virginia in particular, di very different from Northern Virginia. Next slide, please. Um, as you know, I was uh, asked to be on the task force of Connected DMV to work on the re re recovery plan for the, uh, the DMV. Uh, that is moving along pretty rapidly. Um, Alex Imes and, uh, and Spencer um, have been really helping me on putting together the, um, the real, the real like, agenda uh, that we're going to take forward in the work plan that we've put together for the next six months. Um, what we want to come out in the next six months is a regional economic development strategy that involves all of Northern Virginia, all of sub suburban Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Um, on, um, on the steering committee of this group, um, we have myself and Stephanie Landrum representing Northern Virginia um, Economic Development Alliance. We have, and then we have um, Ben Wu and David Iannucci representing Suburban Maryland um, and their Economic Development Alliance in Maryland. And then we have, we're asking for the Deputy Mayor uh, to serve um, on the steering committee also from, from the District of Columbia. We believe that if we take this forward with the same uh, desire for transparency, uh, mutual support, and cooperation that we did with the Northern Virginia Economic Development Alliance, that we will be successful. So uh, we have our first meeting, I believe, on the 25th. So um, I'm excited about that. And uh, I think that we'll have some reported out to you probably in the late November, early December. Next slide, please. A second event um, that um, I just had a ball um, um, on, I actually was the moderator of this event. I had the honor of having um, Senator Warner um, on a panel along with the president, uh, Doyle Mitchell, president of the, um, the Industrial Bank, which is one of the oldest African-American banks in the United States. Uh, they had just completed an expansion of buying a bank in Delaware and I think one in New York. So they've been very active in expansion. Um, we also had an entrepreneur, Stacy uh, Redmond, who has a company that she started um, about, I think it's about 15 years ago now. And when she started her company, she had an 800 plus um, credit score and she could not borrow from her bank. 
I mean, and her story is one of those, and she just said, okay, I'm borrowing from my 401k program. And she launched her business. Now she has a successful business and she told her story, which was fantastic. And then Ellis Carr was on. Ellis Carr runs a national community development uh, finance corporation, which um, spans from the West Coast to the East Coast. And we really talked about the challenges of minority businesses, the challenges of the institutions that lend to them, and, and the things that can be done legislatively that could help them. And what was really great is that there's actually a piece of legislation going through uh, Congress right now that we're hoping um, maybe later in the fall might be able to get back on the agenda um, and get passed. And if it does, it will give grants uh, to uh, African American and minority owned banks and community development financial institutions for technology so that they can catch up on technology and it will provide um, funding that they can leverage uh, from the Federal Reserve. And those two things are the things that these banks need to do to do more lending. And since they mo do most of the lending to minority communities, they need the capital because they do it best. Uh, next slide, please. You, some of you may know um, that I've been serving for the last three years on the Virginia Economic Development Partnership uh, Steering Committee for the statewide strategy. Every two years, um, we revamped the strategy. We're in that process right now. Uh, we had our first, um, what I call tune-up meeting about two weeks ago. Um, and that, it, went, it came off very well. Um, and, but we have a lot of work to do still. And we have a, a deadline in October that we have to meet. Uh, I do believe that we're adjusting the, um, the plan, the strategy to meet the COVID requirements. That's really what's, what's really the, the challenge, uh, but we'll get it done. Next slide, please. So we have, we're starting to develop new ways of working international. This is the third uh, conversation about international. This one really focused on 20 um, companies in particular. Um, Jatender uh, helped put this together. It was fabulous. Um, I got the opportunity to talk to these uh, tech companies, these small growing tech companies. I don't think any of them had more than 15 or 20 employees, uh, but looking at market opportunities in the US, um, and it was really interesting to see um, the questions that they asked because it was very practical. How do I register my company? What's the best co corporate structure? You know, where, you know how, how, much, how much income can I earn before I have to have a license? Is that, is that a dollar or is that, you know, is that a level? But it was really one of those practical sessions. And I think that when we roll out of this COVID situation, we're gonna have a lot of business that we develop through processes like this. Next slide, please. Um, I had the opportunity, thank you, Kathy Lang, chairwoman. Uh, uh, she had gave me the opportunity to speak to the 123 Club. Uh, and in this case, I had the honor to be on the agenda with uh, Secretary Ball of the Department of Commerce of the state of Virginia. And we talked about, um, you know, basically the state strategy, some of the things that the state is doing. And the great thing about it is that a lot of it plays into the talent pipeline and technology where we really shine. Uh, so there's a lot uh, moving in our direction right now. Um, and it was a joy to, to be on with, uh, with the Secretary of Commerce. I had not seen him since the, I think the ribbon cutting, uh, actually the announcement for, the, um, for, for Amazon HQ2. So it had been a while. So it was good to be on with him. Next slide, please. We are trying to branch out into other industries. This is the Northern Virginia Building Industry Association, which primarily focuses on residential. Uh, spoke to their board of directors. And um, they're working with myself and Mike Batt and others to develop a, a, a trades workshop, one focus on trades, because we've been focusing a lot on technology um, and reskilling and upskilling in technology, but there are also a lot of jobs available in, in the construction industry. So we want to figure out a way that we can also serve that industry. Next slide, please. Um, and this was a commercial um, real estate event that took place um, just a week ago, and it was it was one of those where I had the opportunity to be on with Brian Kenner, who is um, um, Amazon's uh, regional head of policy, and he conducted a um, a a group um, really that talked about what's going to happen uh, post COVID. And by the way, Kevin's uh, report, uh, Mike and Kevin's report that they just talked about, is really what we needed for this session because without data analysis, really there's a lot of conjecture. Um, and then there's a lot of contravailing forces and, and countering messages. I just want to just make one example. Uh, Google announced uh, th that it was not going to go back to the office until 
until the summer of next year. And then there was an article about out today about the incredible value that Google sees in collaboration in the office. What's going on here? That's because it's all being discovered unless you do some analytics. Um, and, and that's really what we are, are trying to do. We're trying to get out of the guessing game and get into the what's really happening. Next slide, please. And this is the last slide. Um, this is on talent attraction. Uh, tomorrow, Mike Bat is going to um, open up a, a talent attraction workshop. And I want Mike to go ahead and just give a couple of sentences on, on what's going to happen at that workshop. And then I'll hand it back to uh, the chairman. Thanks, Victor. So well, tomorrow we'll have you know 100 plus um, talent recruiting leaders from across the county, and we're going to try to do this maybe on a quarterly basis. We're, we're going to record this and post it, but we're going to be basically sharing the um, all of the resources that we're providing on how we're bringing talent to the area to help them fill their roles. Um, we have DCI that will be. Um, presenting some market research on how talent views us, doing some of this, sharing some of the survey information across the region. Um, we'll close with some key action items around profiling their companies on our talent site and registering for our career fairs, our upskill for, uh, uh, career fairs, and, and really just continuing to get the message out that we're you know, providing this value to our, our uh, companies here in the county. So we're looking forward to that event tomorrow. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. And I'll turn it over to Chairwoman Lang. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much to the staff for all the, the work you've put in. And we appreciate your work, Kevin, um, and your team. So unless there are any final comments or questions from the commissioners, I'm going to ask for a motion to close the meeting. So moved by Commissioner Partridge. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, by Lenny. And can we just vote all in favor? Aye. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Andrew for his final comments. Thank you, Chairman Lang. So this concludes the September meeting of the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority Commission. I'd like to thank everybody who has joined us this evening for the meeting. And if any member of the public has not asked a question yet, please email Cheryl Martelli of the FCEDA. Once again, her email address is in the chat box. And for more information about the work of the EDA, please visit www.fairfaxcountyeda.org. Thanks everybody, stay safe, be well, have a good night. Thank you, Thanks good night everyone. everyone.